Hey guys, thank you for tuning in to another episode of InRange. We are very thankful to have Cy and Lauren of Hudson Manufacturing here today, named after you guys yourselves because you're the creators of the company. Yes. So what we're going to do is I asked our Patreon supporters if they would like to do a Q&A with you two about your company and your gun. And the resounding response was in one day over four pages of questions. Some of them consolidate down into specific categories. And I'm going to start off with the one that we got the most of, even though it's maybe not the most interesting one. But it's the same one you and I had, Ian. Red Dot Sites, and there's four of them, and I'm just going to ask one of them. But So Robert S., Matthew J., Rumble Strip, and Adam C. Will there be a factory standard version that already has the cutout for carry optics? Are carry optics even possible with the design of your pistol? And if so, when would such a thing be available? One more example is how hard is it to cut the slide for a Red Dot Sighting system? All right. This is kind of in the classic guise of great pistol. It's not what I want. How can I change it? It's completely <laughs> possible. Uh... I do know that one of our engineers spent time that he wasn't allotted in order to check and make sure <laughs> that it was possible. Cool. I will not give a date because our marketing team works a little too hard to steal that thunder from them and see if they can come out a fun way to tease it. Uh, if you're going to cut on it yourself, uh, there's some safety considerations. It is a new design. There's the floor of your drop safety and where that spring pocket is. Mm -hmm. So if you're just going to go cut on it yourself, I, we definitely prefer uh, reaching out. I uh, don't know if we're going to give it to you just yet because I'd like to have us offer it to you first, but if, uh, if y'all clamor hard enough and uh, there's enough interest, maybe maybe some other people will beat us to market because let's, let's not stop the aftermarket support. We really would rather encourage that. Absolutely. Reading into what you said, it's interesting to note that uh, whether it was appropriately done or not, there was research done into making sure this was viable before you went to market. Yeah. He, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> like, for example, everyone's tried to red dot enhance many pistols. Like the right. Glock is the role in special and historically very successful, but you're seeing everyone do this to a degree. Mm -hmm. But like, for example, the CZ pistols really don't have enough material to do it reliably. So, well, you know, one thing we saw when we talked to you guys at SHOT Show was you had spent the time to investigate a whole lot of potential options, mm -hmm. even if there were things you didn't plan to do at first. Like, we need to keep this in mind for the future and that in mind and make sure the design is compatible with this and this and this. And so it doesn't surprise me at all to hear that it was actually something that was looked at. Well, I don't want to jump ahead, but we've been talking for a few hours. Once we get to your question, I'm sure you have about sites. Mm -hmm. That's something I definitely want to address. And, uh, but uh, I'll use your audience for this. Breaking news. Rear, rear, rear sight in front or behind the optic? Because it's 50-50. These guys both have their own opinion, but... Behind the optic. <laughs> behind the optic. But tell us in the comments. But no, we agree. We should get that input. Yeah, yeah. I strongly believe behind the optic is a more practical implementation. So we will see what happens. But we'll go from there. But so anyways, it is happening and is possible. And the gun was designed with that to be viable. Absolutely. Awesome. I'm really excited. As soon as I have a red dot... On the Hudson for myself, my Glock is going. Well, we straight up can say this: we both, both Ian and I have Roland Special like builds. I have one that's fully comped and all that, and we take it out and we're shooting these guns. And I've had a ton of success with that. It makes what is a Glock, which is a Glock, it makes it this incredible system. Really, it almost becomes like Jedi. You're just like, how is this happening? And then we started shooting your gun. I'm like, this is a nicer gun in every way, but man, I miss my dot. Just being honest, and so that's where this is it's coming from. It's like getting a new car and then not being able to mount an optic on it. Yeah, there's there there is no one more frustrated by the delay in the timeline. Oh, no, no, no. You know, <laughs> your analogy is good. It's like getting a brand new car and it somehow doesn't have cruise control. Like, right. you don't need it. It's not essential, but you're like, I only want to go 70 right now. It's just, <laughs> so we'll go there from there. All right, so I got a bunch of general questions. Carl V, what was the biggest hurdle getting into business with such a distinctly new design, and how can other up-and-comers prepare for the same challenges? By the way, these questions are totally cold. These guys they don't know. haven't seen. I haven't even seen the list, actually. No warning. Uh... The, ed the education portion, uh, do, whenever you look at our, our first and our second prototypes, uh, we paid for, or we got our education paid for along the line. We went through three groups of patent lawyers, three groups of engineers, uh, three groups of uh, marketing uh, intensive brain trust, and it was, and there's your other, think about that, that's a lot of cost. Mm -hmm. You have to actually have something that you believe you can do the research development there are a lot of a lot of pitfalls uh, the best start um, and I think we've talked about this a little bit get your legal paperwork in place mm -hmm. get your NDAs uh, doesn't protect you it's not 100% protection but if you're gonna get start getting into it um, 
for, before you send anyone any drawings and you want to look at something, uh, have a lawyer, a good lawyer, get you something that at least gives you initial protection. It's a lot harder for someone to get at the jump. They have to be a legitimately bad person if they're going to get at the jump after you have the NDA in place. And then some people are not going to, uh, going to look at your stuff or give you any time because they don't want to be accused of possibly stealing your idea. So if you're going to keep on trying, mm. keep on trying. Keep on sending it out there or getting uh, feedback. That, that's where I would go. I don't know about you. We had the, not just the mechanical education that we got going through each of the iterations and uh, I guess also the manufacturability thing. There, mm. there can be a design, but oh, yes. we had the intent of being a production level gun. So it's, it's the how do I make this repeatable, um, that whole lean manufacturing process. That was another business angle that we got a gigantic crash course on. And I, one of the hardest things was surrounding ourselves with people smarter than us on all of those things. We have a phenomenal team. Nice. That we that huge, huge hurdle to this. So. You know, that brings up an interesting thing. Like everyone thinks John Browning was this absolute genius of a gun designer. And he totally was. But what he did is he came up with an idea and he patented it and then he'd sell the patent to a company like Winchester. And Winchester had a whole team of people led by some really smart engineers whose job was to take Browning's brilliant patent and turn it into something they could actually build and market. Yeah. And you guys have taken on both of those jobs, coming up with the idea and then also making it commercially feasible. Yeah, is it, it is possible to compose a piece of music that human hands cannot play. Yes. And you could design a firearm that would be a one-off that you could build one of, but it would be absolutely cost in ineffective to be able to produce it in mass numbers. Yeah, I absolutely. think there's actually an iteration of ours that you might want to talk about. So. Okay. Yeah, it, uh, there was no other way for it to be created as designed other than 3D printing, yeah. which is... <laughs> uh, not yet a not, viable option. Not yet there as far oh. as like actually mass quantities produced. It's coming. Yeah. That is coming. I'll, I'll be excited when it does. It's neat. Yeah. yeah. It's very cool. So it, and the, the marketing side of it too. So oh, we had not yeah. only the mechanical, the manufacturing, but what hurdles did we have to actually breaking into uh, to break into a market? That's a good like point. This. You could make a fantastic product, but if no one hears about it, no one's going to buy it, right? Right. Uh, yeah. So... Shot show, um, people are like, well, how did y'all do it? And we actually say, no, we didn't do it, actually. It was the internet and firearms enthusiast media that did it. Hmm. Uh, we, did a, we did a brand video, a website, and a teaser campaign, and then we showed up with a product to shoot on Industry Day at the range. And it took off. Um, we... Well, we spent a lot, a lot of time going through, you know, how do we position it? What do we make it look like? What do we do? Um, but, <clears throat> yeah, that, that could have gone a completely different you, way. You know, this is a little bit off the topic of this, but this, you're, you're bringing up a good point. There was a lot of hype at the SHOT Show about your product, mm -hmm. and that was a good thing. But th at the same time, I think I've been watching, like, your Instagram, for example. Mm -hmm. You guys are pretty um, proactive in terms of putting out a lot of high quality stuff on things like social media is that was that always part of the idea or was that someone you hired we we wanted to be very very deliberate in our social media and it yes it does tame down some of the creativity and some of the funny stuff that we can do mm -hmm. um you can do you can do a lot of fun stuff but we wanted to be very very deliberate in the imagery that we were putting out um i will say one of the big challenges we did recently was showcasing people's holsters Mm -hmm. We did that as like a, a small mini campaign, not really launching that as a campaign, but anyone who took, any company who took the risk on a small startup and doing prototype holsters uh, and sending them to us, we wanted to showcase their product and say thank you. Mm -hmm. So making two to three taglines for somebody else's company over the space <laughs> of two weeks, I'm, I'm, we're, we're going to try huh. not to do that too many more times. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, if someone's willing to put the effort into making accessories for your product, there's no reason to cross promote. That's a good thing. That's Absolutely. that's a good symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Once we get to the rear sights yeah. and, and front sights, we'll hit we'll <laughs> that up again. We'll get there. I'll move on before, because we got pages here. <laughs> Philippe F. How does it feel to get feedback about your design, your ideas, and your products, and finally to be where you are at this point shipping the product? So I guess what I'm going to paraphrase that is you're obviously going to get input from the audience and the consumers as they purchase the gun. How does that feel to get feedback, positive and negative, on what is now your, your production baby? We listen to the videos 
in the morning. It's part of our reading the news routine. Mm. So we're, we're trying to see what people are putting out there on the reviews. And there's always this sort of pit in your stomach going, oh, did he like yeah. it? Oh, I'm Did he sure. like it? God, that's going to so, be, um, the whole process has to be incredible. It puts a whole yeah. new term into don't read the comments. You need yeah. to read the comments. <laughs> you're, you're forced into reading that, that, that section. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's what got the design where it was reading the comments in the first place, yeah. not about hmm. our design, about other designs. Uh, everything was case study. It so. is an incredible moment of satisfaction, validation, whenever you hear someone say, um, this is awesome, or that they like it. It is an incredible pit in the stomach whenever someone says that there might be an issue. Right. But we turned that very quickly, and I was really proud of our team. We have an awesome customer service team. Um, if there is something negative, we're tracking it down. If they don't post about it or they don't ask for you know us to look at it, we're tracking it down. And we're, we want to be aggressively customer service oriented um, because we have had the instance where um, someone said that they were having an issue when they didn't have a pistol. Um, but, oh, they complained about it they didn't even own. Okay. But, but, we, but we've also had the instance where um, a rear sight set screw was missing. Um, and we actually tracked down the lot number when it was, we went from uh, a manually putting on the sites to an automated system within the space of a few serial numbers that had been missed in the holdover process. And I think that was within the first uh, 50 pistols out the door, mm. but we tracked those people down and we got them sent and it's a limited lifetime warranty and we're trying to honor that as aggressively as possible. I think it's unrealistic for anyone to expect any bit of technology as complex as a new pistol or even software to come out and be 100% right out of the box. It's just not realistic. Things are going to happen. And so the, the, the thing that matters is a response to problems that's yeah. proactive and beneficial. Absolutely. Don't ignore things. Yeah. Continuous I, process improvement. I mean, across, across the board from the in-house assembly, how, how we run everything. I'd say the gut punch is when uh, someone says, oh, well, they, they came to market not ready yet. I do not believe that to be true. Uh, a missing rear sight set screw. That's not indicative it, of not ready. It's, it's not, it's not the same friend. thing. One, one thing that we had early on is some people were uh, pulling it right out of the box and they were running it, which is what you're supposed to do. Um, we were using an oil-based lubricant instead of a copper or molly, but oil sometimes dries out if, if it's on a shelf or if someone wipes mm -hmm. it down real quick well if you have a copper or mo uh, molly based lubricant it's harder to get off it's coming in the box you can pull it out you can start running it and it's lubricated mm -hmm. that was a process that also early on was changed once we saw someone do that we're like mm -mm, yep we're moving we like the theory of the oil mm -hmm. and uh got ready literally ready to go out of the box i can tell you yeah. when we took this one out of the box it was lubricated and ready to go so yeah. it had not dissipated <laughs> it's interesting how much there is, on the one hand, as a purist, you'd like to be able to say, here is a mechanical thing, which deserves to be judged on its mechanical merits. But over in the real world, there's so much emotional content and first impression content and little things like that can make or break a product in a way that is, in, a, in an objective sense, completely unfair. And it's, that's something, that's getting back to that last question, it's like, what are the pitfalls? Well, you'd better be ready to do a lot more than that mechanical thing that started the whole project. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. it, it could be mechanically ready to go out of the box. If someone has a negative customer experience or a negative product experience, we had uh, someone um, shipped it or, or received it from, at their dealership, dealership, that sounds like a car, <laughs> at their dealer location uh, with a ripped box. And that actually really upset us With because a scotch taped up ripped <laughs> box. Yeah, so that means somewhere along the yeah. line, whether it's whoever was loading it taped it up, we sent them a new box. That, that's part of the customer experience. We spent a lot of time and energy. On oh it. no, no, you um, did yeah. spend a lot of time the, on that. The yeah. unboxing for some is, I mean, the awesome right. it's, it's, people keep packaging for certain. You and I just spoke so. about that before we began on video here. It's like to me, the gun could come in a Ziploc bag. I'd be like, whatever. I mean, because I'm interested in that. Right. Yeah. But you're right. There's and you you are appealing to a, a market that is frequently underestimated in terms of quality. Like I mean, yeah. I mean, you get a plastic box made out of garbage, and you're it's you're targeting a specific demographic here, at least at the first iteration. Well, if if most people, if they have a plastic box for their pistol, they can use. 
that box for this pistol as well. If that's what they're using for the airline, oh well, yeah. You know, but I had a stack of that 1.30 mm -hmm. plastic pistol boxes, and then you know, whenever I was younger, the ignorance. I was like, I don't know if I'm supposed to get rid of those things or if I'm allowed but to. But if that's the serial number, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's kind of funny, and it's it's thing. silly because we're talking about a gun. But that box, when it's all put together, you could put that on your bookshelf. It actually looks pretty cool. Like, well, where's my pistol? It's on the bookshelf, right? I mean, you, you could. Yeah. You've done collectors a favor because in a hundred years. Having a oh, 100% box is going to add like 30% to the value of your Hudson 9. All right. Oh, all right. We got to keep going. S Scott W., during development, how well did your team stay focused on developing the H9 and were there temptations to go down different paths? He's the temptation for everything to go down. Now. I mean, it's, we're, we have a really balanced team in the set that we're continuing to challenge and it's how we came up with keep advancing so we, we want to continue to challenge stuff but at the same time you gotta fully bake one idea <laughs> and uh so you weren't world war ii germany where you're like let's make everything oh wait uh, we now have no resources i mean <laughs> Uh, a lot of companies get stuck in that. Software companies and fire yeah, companies. Right. The, the, the try to do everything is a, is a dangerous and compelling argument. And yet, doing nothing new is equally as dangerous. Like, for example, let's, let's come out with the H9 in five different cartridges right out of the box. Like, that's a hard thing to... That's an inertia that's hard to fight against. Do you, do you make it from the ground up? where it can accept different barrels, where it could accept 40 cal. Do you do that amount of testing? Mm -hmm. um, what if you want to do a 380 like uh, H&K back in the day where you can switch out all the different barrels like it was the P4? Yeah. Um, all those came into play. And then do we do anything where the grip becomes modular, where we can put in a different magazine so that we shave oh, off t uh, tenths of time or months of time later on down? Uh, should we have a stamped... And, and a machine, the Animim um, uh, slide catch, just for different people who have different tastes. Mm. Yeah, I could see what that could. You could go down an incredible rabbit hole with any of that. Brutal. Yes. Yeah. yes. So how did you stay on focus? I mean, because you, I think, I think you made the right decision of focusing on making the first best thing you could make without getting caught in that web of mystery. But how do you avoid that problem? What is, what's the way to to not go there? It was a balanced team, and a. 10 to 20 year plan instead of a one to five. Oh. Wow, that's a long one. Yeah. yeah. All right. And Interesting. Cool. But yeah, well, it sounds it sounds great, but you you pitch that to investor. 20 year plan. Yeah. Who do you think you are? Well, I think you have to keep that. Don't you have to keep that kind of secret from the investors? <laughs> Give them that one to camera. Well, it's funny because in, 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 in infosec land, I'd sit there and they'd have a five year plan. I'm like, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but this is a little different. Yeah. Well, the uh, the patent, uh, justifying the patents, going after the patents, which uh, I guess we can share this publicly for the first time. Our first patent that we put in for three years ago was granted about a month and a half ago. Congratulations. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Nice. And so we're no longer patent pending. And our first utility. utility. We, we've yeah. had one design awarded, but it, that was a gigantic milestone for us. Now that so. it's granted, give us the number. We'll put it in the links. People would love to look at that, Ooh. quite honestly. Yeah, I'll, as soon as Absolutely. I can grab that, that'd be great. We'll put it in the yeah. links. Yeah, people, no, our audience would want to go look yeah. at it. Definitely. Awesome. Well, yeah. It looks a lot more like the brick, the actual patent. It's okay. Anyway, it looks a lot more like the brick than that because. Uh, if we don't put that in the link, we're going to get requests. So you know give what? me the number. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm glad you brought that up. There are people who look at patent drawings for old, weird guns and they're like, why can't you build one? You've got the patent drawings. The answer is half the time the patent drawing looks like something that just barely functions and maybe only the one specific piece that they're trying to patent. Yeah. We, we were not educated enough at the time to uh, take a course like that or think like that, but if I was doing a patent right now, it would be a lot more along those lines yeah, where you couldn't enough. guess the specs of it by mm. looking at it. Yeah. Or you just draw it on a napkin and mail it to yourself and then don't open the envelope, right? <laughs> I mean. <laughs> we're first to file now. Yeah. We're, first, we're not first to invent anymore. Yeah, I'm kidding, obviously, okay. guys. Yeah, all right. So, well, Andy, what type of software did you use in the design and manufacture? SolidWorks, Mastercam, something else really cool they don't even know about? I'm currently studying to be a machinist. The first software that we used was Microsoft Paint and PowerPoint. <laughs> you said that, yeah. Um, true, true story. Um, but we, as we went through with multiple engineering teams, uh, the more firearms-based stuff has we've seen more SolidWorks. SolidWorks is but very, very heavy in the firearms industry. Uh, prior to that, it was Pro E that we were hmm. seeing yep. a lot of, but that was uh, general design engineering. I think just for more mechanical systems. 
Yep. So um, if you're getting into the firearms industry, SolidWorks is your best place to start. Wow. Unless you have an in with a specific company that you know they use uh, Pro-E or something different. Uh, but if you're going to pick one and you're going into firearms land, you said SolidWorks seems SolidWorks. like the one that... Well, whenever we moved to a firearms-based uh, engineering firm, uh, they had to take time to recreate files, and that's a very scary process when hmm. you already have some stuff dialed in. Yep. Okay. SolidWorks. There you go. I, oh God, I love this guy because he always asks great questions and I always mess up his name. Amon R. Did you guys expect the reception of your handgun that it got when it hit the market? Were you expecting better or worse? By reception, I mean both what the average consumer has to say, but also the quote-unquote firearms experts or critics have to say. Hoped for, but we were blown away by the response that we had at SHOT Show. We very much wanted to do a teaser campaign um, in the sense that everyone that we were following at the time, reading the blogs, checking out what people were excited to see at SHOT Show and knowing that we had this thing in the works, it, that it, it was nice to see that come full circle and to see the, the names that we're familiar with out of the range. and. Um, yeah. Just you know, getting to actually see people shoot it. It was trying to not act starstruck. Try, oh yeah, <laughs> that was funny. Trying to not act starstruck and actually, um, it, it was excellent for us, and I think just perfect that the the format of Shot Show had Industry Day at the range at the front end of it. Mm. I don't know that the rest of Shot Show would have been nearly as much of a success if people didn't have the opportunity to shoot it. Oh, yeah, no. You, so you'd say media day at the range was a big deal. It was huge. It was, We're being joined now. We now have Doggo. Yes. Right now. So media day at the range was a valuable resource for you guys in this process. Absolutely. We're going to be there again this year. Cool. Oh, you are. Absolutely. Cool. Dar I, Dharma's a big I, fan I, of the Hudson. I know. I know. There you go. I know. Come on. I know. And yeah, yeah, all right. All right. Okay. Cool. So then uh, I'll keep going here. Nick C., what are your personal roles now that you're in production? Are you on the factory floor? Let me paraphrase that. How did you forget the set screw in the rear sight? Nice. <laughs> no, seriously, no, he didn't know that. Oh, okay. but, no, but, uh, I'm adding that. So, oh, wait, wait, wait. Awesome. Now that you're in production, what's happening for you two personally next, or right now? Right now, we're making sure that we're getting our produ production numbers up. Uh, we know that we had a delay earlier this year. Uh, we are going through the ramp up that we expected. It's just happening later than what we expected. So okay. we're uh, much more tactically involved at this point then what we hope to be we would like to start getting our armors course deployed mm. oh, like to cool. start doing yeah. uh, more range time and actually showcasing the product rather than doing as much conventional marketing uh, get to okay. talk to you know like you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what I mean like no, on, a nor on a normal day besides this fun day for you guys coming out here thank you again um, are you in an office room are you walking the factory floor what do you personally where are you at both both um, you're walking the floor making sure things are right I mean it's it's a combination um, right now we're we're getting positioned to scale and I know that sounds mm -hmm. really really corporate mm -hmm. but <laughs> we are pulling people with us, uh, a couple other people in the company, and we're all doing everything all at the same time. And then uh, staying till 19, 20, 100, going over task list, uh, reporting uh, structures, or we're on a plane with our supply, you know, to go off to our suppliers and talk to them. Making sure it's dialed in, that things are coming in at the same rates, that we're all gearing to take it up a notch every single. You're so probably more busy you, now than you were before. I bet it's even worse, and worse in quotes. Yeah. But, well, I keep on. You do low rate production initially, and as you're taking more and more steps to go, you have to worry more and more about what what things do we need to put in place to make sure that we don't overlook stuff. Let me so. correct what I meant by worse. Your personal time consumption is worse. Oh, That's yeah. what I mean by that. Oh, it's much worse. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I mean. It's much, much worse. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking okay. of skills you didn't realize you were going to have to develop. Uh, sure. Is petting yeah. the dog. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> it's all good. All right, Andrew D. Oh, this is a good one. Is there a way to invest in your company? That's interesting. Yeah. Besides well, buying buy, a I was going to say buying each uh, nine. All right, all right. Enough done. There's a, there we go. Lie down in the, in the corner. <laughs> all right. Um, we are not currently, we are a privately held company. Uh, Lauren and I still do maintain majority ownership. A lot of that has been done 
because of the sweat equity and what we're doing, mm -hmm. the intellectual property, um, we are not currently open for outside investment. Uh, if if you have a, a dollar figure in mind, I'm, I'm sure that if, if it's a rather large one, we might get you to sign an NDA and then have a discussion after that. But uh, the real big issue, whenever we consider things like you know uh, Kickstarter or something like yeah, that, sure. yeah. you start dealing with not only fire federal firearms laws and then you go into ITAR and then you go into uh, yeah. background checks and then uh, whether or not there's any you know if there if there is an issue on whether or not you know something uh, would happen catastrophic mm -hmm. uh, is it their fault is it our fault you know you're looking at it's like kickstarting a car yeah that's a nightmare yeah so it, I mean it, it would it be theoretically possible yes <laughs> but right right now for us even though this is a big risk, we are very risk averse, and so we're trying to keep right uh, at the current time. We're growth focused. We're growth focused. Well, I mean, I would think you're not open for public, like you said, and the whole idea of, of venture capitalists or any of that sort of stuff, where other voices get involved in your company, there is always a big risk of losing your vision. Yeah. Absolutely. At yes. you know the the H nine is what we launched with, but we also intended, like you were talking about the look and the feel of Instagram, the the packaging, stuff like that. We very much want to delay the foundation for launching a brand. Okay. And we don't want to lose the direction of that until... Well, I would argue you already have a brand from what I've seen of your marketing. Thank, well, thank you. That's mm -hmm. yeah. not an accident. I know. No, so but I mean, you say you're delaying. I think I already see it. But supporting the brand, get it. branded clothing is, is, is mm -hmm. part of a brand lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to see Hudson manufacturing stickers on the back of cars? Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, a little, little bit. <laughs> well, I mean, um, hey, that's a brand. That's what happens. Well, yeah. well I, the thing <laughs> is, uh, that is a brand. Though. Though. Absolutely. Yeah. A, a late come in investor is interested in quarterly profits right. and dividends, and that, not what the twenty year plan. Is. That's exactly that's exactly correct. Is if you present a new investor with, hey, we're not making much money for the next five years, and everybody's like, what? You're selling a ton of pistols. You're yeah. Yeah, and everything's going back to infrastructure growth, hiring people. You know, if you made this plastic, we could reduce costs, right? That's exactly. the kind of stuff that starts happening. Yeah. 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 No, but that is literally the risk of that scenario. Mm -hmm. It is. So, okay. So, no, you can't invest until they already become fabulously wealthy and then don't care about Unless it. Unless you have enough money that it makes it very much worth the while. I understand. That's a good question. It's a good it's question. It's a that, flattering question. That is a very yeah. flattering question. Thank you. So, Michael B., for not having any experience in manufacturing or designing a gun before, did you have a lot of pushback from the industry, i.e. people in the field already making guns and parts? <laughs> yes. Um, Absolutely. Or anyone who would sign the NDA. Yeah. So they would, they would be willing to talk to you until the NDA came out and then suddenly they would vanish? Uh, usually, um, there were a couple who did not want to sign an NDA and would push us for information and we just didn't do it. We just made, we made the commitment and there were some good big names and then after they'd get the NDA they'd see what we were doing and just like it, 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 they've never seen it done before why, why would you do it mm -hmm. um, there was some of that and uh, from from what I'm understanding of the question to actually being able to manufacture a lot of people uh, early on why do you want a straight pull trigger a lever is so much more easy to design engineer uh, get a safety work everything is more difficult when you have a straight mm -hmm. line inline trigger. Why would you do this? Feels really nice to shoot. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a lot of. So you're right. Why are you making a more difficult thing to manufacture when you could do this? So mm -hmm. kind of like you can make this plastic. <laughs> I mean, down that same path, yeah, right? Absolutely. Exactly. Um, but I've had so many people ask the question. I don't know if this is another one, but why don't you see other big companies do this? Why? Why would they? They sell a million of their product a year. They, they do, and you know what, from a business standpoint, a, capital, a capitalistic standpoint, there was not a lot of motivation, and what they did is they started focusing on design for manufacturability, mm -hmm. and when you start looking at the leaps and bounds, like uh, the slide, uh, the slide manufacturability for a 320 or a Caracol, mm -hmm. they hollow out and they put something in there, it's an insert. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's groundbreaking in a way that some people don't want to recognize, and how how much cost savings, how much time savings there in that in order to actually get something to scale. Mm -hmm. So um, we did not have uh, invest that, that type of investor or quarterly profits or those things in our way to innovate. And uh, now creating the culture 10 years down the line to where we continue to push that, 
uh, that's something we're going to have to commit to as a company and as a culture for us to continue to challenge ourselves and not focus on only quarterly profits. Some, but, some companies are able to, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm dominating this one, you go. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say there, <laughs> on the, uh, the, the quick response thing, yeah, there were absolutely, uh, one really good sound bite, you get a non-disclosure agreement in place and we had somebody say, you know there's a lot that goes into making a firearm. <laughs> Wow, really? Thanks, yeah. guys. <laughs> but, I mean, so we were, we were met with a lot of that at the same time, especially with um, their industry partners that picked us up. And, okay. I mean, we've had some great, great partnerships from day one, and they've been phenomenal to us. And valuing the non disclosures and actually getting the design and what the intent is and the market. And honoring the hush hush of an NDA, that's what allowed us to do a teaser campaign because mm -hmm. people had not actually seen it. People hadn't broken NDA. And a lot of that doubt about whether or not this would be a real thing, that it it helped us launch. I find it fascinating that there would ever be an expectation to do any of this sort of work without an NDA. And the fact that someone, when you asked them to sign it, would want to walk away, mm -hmm. that was a very alarming um, warning sign to me because it's not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. it, uh, some people do find it to be a very big deal. Um, you know, and I'd, I, I'd be curious, not about who, but why, because that seems like a dangerous precedent. Well, and I guess if it's a new idea, if they're in the industry, the one way I respect is, like I said, if, if I was saying I have a new idea and you're someone working on your own idea and you don't want to ever be accused of a lawsuit of trying to steal theirs or ever get any of that, I would refuse to look at the, the invention. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, yeah. I would never want to be accused of a lawsuit because then it would be my word against theirs, you know, to, to go do that. So that would that that's one reason why some some people may have turned us away eventually to give them the benefit of the doubt. That, well, okay, fair enough. And you know, like you were just saying, that could be a very that could even be a subliminal thing. Like when you talk about, for example, there's no new art. It's always composed of art that came before it turned into a new thing, right? Or you always base your work on something you've seen before. If you were to happen to see something very clever and unique, even if you had no intention of ever stealing such a concept, it could creep into work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. So uh, these are about current production questions, so we'll go there. Joseph G. I would like to know how well your company is doing now that you have released the product and it is for sale. Is the firearm selling well? And have you been able to relax a little bit, or is this just as stressful as the R&D? I think we already touched on that. So how are things now that you actually hit the market? We're starting to make dents in our initial purchase orders. Um, so I, yeah, our, our uh, we're, numbers we're are doing well. We're making dents. Uh, for all the distributors out there, I think actually I'll, I'll put this another way. The education focus on people understanding the difference between a distributor and a dealer has been more challenging than getting distributor or dealer orders. <laughs> um, and having people, um, it, 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 some people think that we're seeing part of the profit on like you know the gun broker guns going for two thousand dollars. No, oh. we only we yeah. we sell only to distributors. They sell to their dealers, and dealers put it out to the market. And so, uh, getting that and making sure people understand that is part of the process. And I was as guilty of this whenever I was whenever I turned twenty one and I started looking. I was like, why can't I buy a gun through Smith and Wesson's website? Mm -hmm. um, um, why won't it ship right to my door? It, uh, I had a great deal of ignorance. Um, but that that's actually been more challenging than worrying about the, the POs for right now. Right now. Uh, the excitement, the reviews uh, are extremely positive from a large portion of the industry mm -hmm. and to the people who've told, got them so them, far. Send as many as you can, as fast as you can. So, awesome. And we're good good problem. More than that. Yeah, yeah. We're working to do that every day. And so, but no, we have not relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> so these two kind of pinch on what you just said, and we don't need to get too specific here, but Brandon T. Uh, says, when comparing availability to my area, which is greater Seattle, and the things you said at SHOT Show, it seems to me that production is behind schedule or in lower quantities than you may have expected. Is that true? And if so, what lessons have you learned about the realities of gun manufacturers that led to the current situation? But let me add the second question because they, they work with each other. Kyle D., or one of the obvious questions, if you can share numbers, how well did the dispute go? So when you talk about that, so I know that you were saying that things are a little bit difficult, right? It's off the bat. You're not at the quite same production numbers you were hoping for. Mm -hmm. But if that's the case, what did we learn about? What about the realities of gun manufacturer made that to be the reality? So we are behind schedule. We're about four or five months behind schedule. 
But our, oh, our scheduled see. ramp up, we always intend to hit USPSA production division legal within three to four months. And we are still on schedule to do that. Define what that means. A lot of people are looking so, at what that means. 2,000 units out on the open market. Okay. And what that means is that we are looking to ship this next week as many as we ship the first month. And we're continually training people and grabbing efficiencies uh, and gaining efficiencies as we go on. Uh, we're hiring. Uh, we are, but we have to train. Anytime there's an issue on the line, uh, it's it's a tenant of lean manufacturing. You stop right there, you fix the problem, and then you go forward. Mm. Not and just so, from the actual manufacturer of the part, um, fixtures in, in-house, for example, for assembly. You've got the an idea in theory, and then you actually go and put something on there, and you're like, you know, that's not as efficient as it could be. I need to actually hold this a little bit better. You take a step back, you retrain it, and it's in, always worth taking the step back to actually get it in many mind. ways, designing a fixture is no different than designing a part in the gun. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Machining, holding, your tolerancing, yeah. how you've had it to where it doesn't scratch the nitride and you have to spend mo- a lot of money to get it you know, yeah. blasted, reefed, tumbled. And yeah. Yeah. So there's that assi- never happens. <laughs> <laughs> so there's assembly line processes that could be made more efficient, I assume, mm-hmm. as well as the machines making the machines. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah and that's a big part of this. And yeah. well, and you know, well, why didn't you spend the past four years? Oh, believe me, there were so many plans. And it is just like any good plan that's a good 100% is that it never goes down. Never survives first contact. <laughs> yeah, never survives first contact. You go on and you keep on. If, if you stopped there, if we stopped every time we hit, you know, an issue, this would have been over three years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's fascinating in historical perspective, and Ian, you could chime in on this, like uh, the Garand. The machines to make the machines. Mm-hmm. He made, like, way more effort into the stuff to maintain the rifle than to ever make the rifle. Yeah, or it to, to yeah. So it's amazing. Yeah, same thing. I think our audience would be interested to see the machines that make the machines someday. Quite honestly, uh, that's really cool. Once the facility's on brand, they won't have people to refer to it. No, that'd be a great tour. I think that's <laughs> yeah. fascinating. It's just as fascinating as the gun, in my opinion. Um, this is sort of similar, but uh, from Jasper W. Was it harder to secure raw materials and production capacity as new firearms manufacturer? than it would have been if you had been an innovative toaster designer. So I guess what he's saying is how much harder is it because it's a gun versus some other thing. Uh, Do you think there's a difference there? Raw materials? Raw materials, I would say not. Um, Financing? Oh, people that want to shy away from a firearm? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah. The raw, the raw materials, they still look at it as you're getting a machine component. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's usually a machine shop that is sourcing it. Um, if you're going to financing, you put your EIN number and you're a firearm manufacturer with an FFL. Mm-hmm. That, that's, a, that, that's where your challenge is. So there are people that would shy away from that as yeah. a result. Yeah. There, wow. We, um, we tried to be as manufacturing focused as possible with that though. Again, our, our team has done phenomenal work to make stuff happen. So making uh, you know, supplier quality requirements and actually coming to the table it, you know, as prepared as possible to have those conversations has helped us out quite a bit, and that's okay. that's a result is of our team uh, that we surrounded ourselves with. But yeah, it's interesting that would not have occurred to me, but when you say it, it makes sense. Yeah, definitely. George J. Uh, how do you do quality assurance from your various suppliers, especially when literally nobody's ever made your parts before? So this is a from this is a scratch kitchen gun. You make mm-hmm. this gravy straight up, right? So since no one's making this in bulk. Otherwise, how do you do your Q&A? Uh, intensively and way a really, really heavy bottleneck up front. Mm-hmm. Whenever you talk about as many in a week as you do in a month, well, the first time we ever got the grip, the insert, the barrel, mm-hmm. the slide, 100% inspection. Mm-hmm. Every piece. Before, every component. That, the, the first couple weeks, yeah. you bet. Mm-hmm. And then your sample size goes down. And then your sample size goes down. And then if there's a variable, it'll go back up. And then you keep on, you do that, and you have to dial it in. You so, have variables as you've reached different rates of production, depending on what the actual manufacturer process is. So if it's a right. machine component versus a molded component, those hmm. have different timelines on when they become something that introduces variability just by 
by use. Yeah, so. just, you know, if they ship you 10 parts in a batch and they're all perfect, that doesn't mean that they can ship you a 1,000 and still have maintained that quality. Supplier selection as well based on process. Um, That's your biggest part of quality if anyone's thinking about getting into this. Supplier selection, first step in quality. Absolutely. Um, making sure your, your documentation is correct. Um, obviously, metrology equipment is something that we use daily, so you're inspecting hardness, height, um, as many possible dimensions as you can, depending on what the, the feature is. So. Metrology, the science of measuring things. <laughs> yes, I knew that. What I was going to say is this. No, 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 that's great. But like, I think that our audience that watches in range, you know, reliably mm -hmm. has heard these messages before. Things like as simple as we just got a sample set of X, whatever steel, 4150 or something, right? Mm -hmm. What's a steel number? So, um, and the hardness of that steel today may not be the hardness of the same, even though it comes a week later. Mm -hmm. So you're right. dealing with something that's not the same raw material you thought you were dealing with right off the bat. And you have, uh, if you have unscrupulous suppliers, they have every every urge to fake the documentation or tweak it and make it look like the that could happen. So you'll yeah. accept them so that just as you don't want to get things back for repair, well, suppliers don't want to have but, to reject part of it. There's always human error. I mean, yeah, well, sure. But the insidious thing about that is that let's say you have this production line and you're, you're relying on supplier Y for steel, mm -hmm. just saying, and it's always been the same quality steel for six months. Mm -hmm. And then month eight, something goes a little awry. You're the one that takes the heat, not the steel manufacturer, when something goes wrong on the gun, meaning a part breaks or something. And, and, yeah. Oh, and those, absolutely, yeah. from a reputation standpoint yeah. as well, right? Yeah. And that's that's kind of a hard problem. The Like I said, the aggressive customer service, uh, the information sharing that we have right now that made it where everyone heard about our pistol within a matter of weeks mm -hmm. is yeah. the same information sharing that we have that if they're ever is something that breaks that they will hear about it in a matter of hours yep. you're right bad news will travel faster than good news and so i mean you look at the history of uh let's use the you know one of the greatest success stories of all time you know the glock mm -hmm. i mean our production numbers that we're going to start hitting this next year are in line with the production numbers from wow that's a way to put it in perspective 1982 to 1992 Wow. The, the best huh. reference number is around 350,000 350, produced. Wow. And so you put that over 10 years, around 35,000 a year. Now think about that. They crank out a million a year right now. Yeah. That is a very cool historical perspective to put yourself yeah. on the same line as Glock. Well, yeah. And <laughs> in a couple of years, you're going to regret life making goals. that. Hashtag career. life goals. goals. <laughs> no, but that's still a very interesting, yeah. that's a great metric to use. Yeah. That's really yeah. cool. Awesome. Stuart R. Are there any mechanical or market restrictions that would prevent the H9 from being released with a standard one-piece trigger and a manual thumb safety in addition to the existing passive safety model? So I think this guy is a competitor, probably looking for the absolute crispest trigger possible. And, you know, in a 1911 guys, the manual safety tends to provide that. The, the first thought on that, when we had gotten to the, the boat anchor, which was an earlier prototype iteration that you guys have seen before, we did have the standard manual safeties on there, no interval trigger safety. And we were really thinking about the market, have a striker fired gun, not really the most common to have manual safeties yeah. on there, the you know, thumb safety sort of setup. And we decided mm -hmm. to opt to allow that to be more of an end user configurable option. Um, modularity uh, has become a more and more popular thing where you know, the shooter actually gets to dial it into their own preference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from a manufacturing liability standpoint, we wanted to make sure that we had another external safety. There have actually been more pistol uh, issues, um, I try not to use the word recall, but there, there have been more of those uh, historically than any other uh, issue with pistols due to the drop safety. And so we, uh, with that trigger safety being an integral part of our drop safety, we will not be shipping it that way from the factory. I know there was a press release last year that mentioned that it would be. They had not been in the legal, uh, meeting with legal the week before, so that did get out there. Um, that person has been sacked. Is it, is it, <laughs> is, Monty Python. Yeah. Is, is it uh, theoretically possible for that to be 
set up that way, it is theoretically possible. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I've seen a picture here and there where there was a manual safety on the H9. I don't know if that must have been a Photoshop or something. We do have those. Yes, they're in mm -hmm. the works. They're being tools. Okay, okay so. but that's a manual safety. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Yes. Including the trigger safety. Mm -hmm. You're not getting, you're not omitting the trigger safety in the process. Correct. Nope, it'll be a, an end user option. If so you if you want it. redundancy to your redundancy. Yes. And Belt I, and suspenders, you can add a manual safety. And, yeah. and I, I think that appeals to... Uh, well, the, the pistol was designed to make it a flatter shooting pistol. So, and the felt grip, uh, if a female shooter has it in the bedside gun at home and wants that extra one step in case there are children, mm -hmm. then there, sure. there, there's some people who want to write. just the female shooter. Hey, or, yeah. 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 Okay, so you're also, you're also <laughs> but for also the 1911 shooter who wants yeah. to rest their thumb and ride and ride the uh, thumb safety there. Um, I'll tell you after 4,000 rounds when you put that in there to test the, how it works, it's really nice to have a nice place to rest your thumb. Yeah. Yeah. So Lauren, you were saying you like it, it's more comfortable to shoot with the safety. I, well, after we were doing endurance testing on it and our hands were dead after <laughs> quite a few days. I mean, just, just dead. Our yep. arms were tired and it was just such a nice natural position to rest your thumb on. Well, I mean, so. there's aftermarket competitive parts where you put a slot, like a grip there that just has that just for that reason alone. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, totally get it. Yeah. Like Gasp. Gas pedal. Yeah, they call it something like that, or accelerator stop, or something like that. But yeah, there are, maybe it's called the gas pedal. There's mm -hmm. even for the Glock. Yeah. Um, Anyways, I need to get back. You know, get some open education. Mm -hmm. Some questions about your future. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Seth P. Hudson H10. When? <laughs> Pretty uh, concise question. You, t you talk to our program engineer, and he, he'll he's probably still trying to make and carve time out to figure that one out. He's a big 10 mil fan. Absolutely. And uh, the amount of time and effort, uh, it'll be another year and a half and maybe even two years to get the engineering going to a, a hot cartridge like that and make sure you do your, your job right. Although I think to date I have heard more requests for 10 over 45. I find this very strange. And I, I, you know, I, 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 no offense, Seth, but why? Like, um, 10 millimeters is a, has a place in the world. Um, in fact, you dealt with this with Larry Vickers on your q &A, Yeah, and they just talked about it. Talk about it's for shooting bears. This, wor this worries me, and I don't, I'm not saying this about Seth, but when I hear what you said about the amount of requests, mm -hmm. I worry how many people ask for something they wouldn't buy. Yeah. What, I want to see a picture of it on Instagram. Do, like, do you have any... I, you yeah. said you yeah, do a lot of... they want to buy it. You do a lot of research. Have you done research into how much 10 millimeter ammunition is actually sold in the United States? It is... It is, it is more of a niche market yeah. than nine. I, I think that's an understatement. <laughs> it's probably well underneath 45, 40. I mean, I, I'm going to guess it's on the lower end of sales. Um, where that would be fun and make sense is we're, we're going back into an era of subguns. Um, the ballistics of mm. nine and your polymer tipped and your, you know, everything that's going on with your subguns nowadays, you know, this, and this is for our program engineer. This is for you, Zach. Mm -hmm. um, a 10 millimeter sub gun you know, it gets cooking at, at what, a yeah. 10 inch barrel. 10 of a sub gun makes a lot of no sense. No squirrels. No squirrels. Don't chase the squirrels. No squirrels. Okay. <laughs> so let me follow up on that question. Is there something that you have in mind for once this is in production and we don't have to deal with it on a daily basis, what is the next Hudson product? Or has that not even been decided yet? Oh, absolutely. Um, we. <laughs> I guess I should say I know it's been decided. Is it something you're willing to? <laughs> it's share? an AR-15. Yeah. yeah. Piston, of course. Yeah, no jokes. Kidding, of course. Yeah. We yeah. um we had actually taken additional time during the R and D process and the multiple iterations to get here. You'll notice that we did not have a chassis several prototype iterations mm -hmm. ago, and that was to enable us to have future product family. No. Um, um, we anticipate that people might get to meet the new member of the family. Industry, at Shot Show. yeah, industry yeah. day at the range. We'll see. <laughs> see Are we talking there. about coming up? Coming up. Coming up. Ooh. I know what we're going to be on Idea Day. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, uh, it, it's don't gonna... ignore us when we come to your booth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what? What? Um, no, I'm not going to make that joke. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I All really right. have to question when I say 10 millimeter. I'm like, oh. well, I mean, you guys were up in Alaska. I could see. You're talking about this with Larry. I could see carrying that instead of some wheel gun against bear or whatever. Well, that they issued that but, for polar bear, right? Mm -hmm. The one little tiny Danish yeah. Arctic patrol. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes, they did actually do issue Glock 20s. Right. So this one's one that didn't occur to me. Karsten J. Will there be a longer barrel version for the EU market, uh, specifically two yeah. centimeters? Apparently there are barrel length restrictions for the EU. There are barrel length issues in large parts of Europe. Well, that sounds like something a, a threaded barrel version could easily take care of. Okay, we got other questions coming. You can address that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So perhaps, um, actually, have you done? Do you have any distributors in Europe? Is it something you've looked at? Is it we very very recently signed on one, and we have been researching it and uh, validating, looking at our paperwork since Shot Show for exports. Um, it took us four years to get into the U.S. market. We are going to take very deliberate steps into the international market. Mm -hmm. uh, as we move forward on that, we, we'll keep on sharing, but uh, we want to get over there and see what the market looks like first. You know, you were talking earlier about ramping up production. There's always a risk of also advancing too quickly. Absolutely. I mean, you think I think you should dominate the one you're in. Mm -hmm before you try to dominate another one. That's a risk. I don't ever want to see Hudson's in the CDNN catalog. Yeah, I, <laughs> let, let's not fight a two-front war. How about uh, that, right? Well, it doesn't I, work. I never want yeah. to make the comment. I always said it was a bridge too far. I don't want to do that. No, no, no. I'm not saying it shouldn't be on the radar, but I would. I think the idea is to get there when the time is right. Yeah. Trying to be extremely deliberate about yeah. timing with that and, and being able to support it. We don't want to, exactly. you know, yeah. one foot in, one foot out. How many companies have we seen in many industries that just went, oh, this is going great. Let's make a store everywhere. And then three years later, there's three left because they overexpanded, yeah. whatever. So. All right, Derek J, kind of similar question. Do you have any plans and works for a 10-round magazine? I would like one of your pistols, but I have the misfortune of living in New York. Yes. Yes, that actual tooling had to be stopped when we hit the uh, delay. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't have the funds to put toward it. We kept all of our people. We focused on training, mm -hmm. and we made sure we could pay our people's salaries as we got through. So the money toward the tooling for the 10 round, as soon as we ship enough pistols, it will be restarted and we will get those to you. And that has relevancy for IDPA as well. I mean, you could use a larger capacity mag, but that helps with those guys too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what about larger magazines? As soon as we have the dollars for that, that'd be a lot of fun. So that's on the list too. So let's go ahead and take that question. Right around the corner. A, a 10 round mag for New York mm -hmm. is one thing and a larger capacity magazine is also on the drawing board. That would just be fun simply because like I said, where the sub gun market is right now, mm -hmm. that would be a lot of fun. Sure. Uh, we touched on this earlier, but I think this is one worth diving into deeper. Joe, are there plans and works for a polymer H9? Polymer frame, let's be specific. So checking, we'll see where the uh, where the Styre patent is in 2020. Styre patent? Uh, the Styre patent, a uh, modular chassis surrounded, uh, surrounded by a polymer exterior, mm -hmm. which is what... Uh, they're currently in court with multiple other companies uh, about that. Ours is steel, which is not uh, covered in the patent. We have our own patent that we have filed for our specific uh, chassis, which is different. However, until it is granted, uh, a small company like ours has no, no dog in that fight. Mm -hmm. has, but because with uh, everything else, the accessories, the... Uh, the sites that we still haven't gotten to, the, the light, you know, tail options, all the things that we need to chase down mm -hmm. and look to support for the H9 product family. Mm -hmm. um, if we entered into something that could get us into a court battle, we might slow down way further. So actually looking at where we want to be with our company, mm -hmm. picking, that, uh, picking that as our next step just doesn't it's kind of like the sense. international distribution question in the same sense as, you know, what, what markets, you know, yeah. we enter into yeah. um, and in a way to not cannibalize ourselves as well. When every, everything we do, we want it to be extremely deliberate. So, so, so if I'm hearing this rightly, there's right correctly, there is a existing Steyr patent that may or may not affect you, but it's not a fight worth fighting right now for you because of the size of the company. If it, we were to go polymer. If we were to go polymer. polymer. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh. I mean, you'd have, you'd have to defend it. If, if we went polymer, you'd have to actually defend what you were doing, uh, which I believe we have a strong legal case, but why would we? Oh, yeah. why the would best we way that? to win a lawsuit is to not get in a lawsuit. <laughs> does it, <laughs> does it, does it, <laughs> Forgotten Weapons has a long video series of history of all sorts of patent fights going on forever, yeah. and they are really weird, and you see all sorts of weird guns as a result of patent avoidance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, are there other ways that you're willing to talk about you could lighten the gun that's not polymer? Multiple. Okay. There, there are multiple uh, ways that we could do that that 
have already been tested and are working very well. Okay, so there are you're, you are working on, uh, by the way, sometimes there are things to be said about a heavy gun, mm -hmm. depending on your purpose, yep. but there's also things to be said about a lighter gun, too. Mm -hmm. So, it just, was, I mean, that's hard. Before we get completely away from it, I think I heard you say 2020. Is that when this Steyr patent 20 expires? 2020 was uh, the last time I checked on it. And if I'm forgetting that it, it's 2021, uh, don't have it right in front okay. of me. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also, they could have had a continuation. Mm -hmm. They could have had a divisional, um, and those haven't published yet. So mm -hmm. um, all that is something that we would take a very deliberate step towards. Okay. A lot of people misinterpret patents and copyrights. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. or, and, and copyrights last basically till the heat death of the universe. Mm -hmm. Patents don't. Mm -hmm. Patents are actually fairly yeah. limited in scope, and you're looking at typically 17 years. So there are these rolling years. strategies you learn about, and, and that's why when yeah. you know people ask us how many patents do you guys have, how many are pending, it's, it's always a range because something goes up for examination, and it you can get one awarded, and that's actually, we said that we have our first utility awarded something splits off of that and gets, you know, you do a divisional so that one can get awarded. And but that gets, awarded two, that gets awarded two years later. And if it is an integral portion, you know how two years extra protection on the life of your invention mm -hmm. if, they right. can't, if they can't get around the second one, which is also a portion of it. So mm -hmm. that was, that was a, it's, its own education. <laughs> um, but actually within our design, uh, whenever we got granted the configuration, which is the overall uh, how it works, the barrel uh, came off as a divisional. Mm -hmm. And oh. it's its own its own thing that we're uh, going to pursue. And you, we could have a four hour conversation about the curiously chaotic version of patent law and how it's currently being enforced. I mean, right. things like, and not gun related, but swipe to unlock or patenting a color or a font are things that have happened in, in different industries. Mm -hmm. So patent law is a spooky, weird world. Yes. It is. Yeah. Um, and, and if you don't have to, like you said, get in a legal fight now. Just don't. <laughs> and for, for anybody who's getting into the whole create your own design and start reading the patent books, uh, they use a lot of fear-based stuff uh, mm -hmm. whenever, you know, how they write. Uh, a lot of it's lessons learned. Mm -hmm. uh, read at least five different ones from five different authors who hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, or, in order to get a good base, um, but you're also going to need financing to create and there, there's a lot of tutorials do it yourself and there's a lot of like international a, patent protection whoa whoa yeah. that's uh, that that one's a whole new uh that sounds like exciting reading we should all get on oh, yeah. <laughs> hours of fun <laughs> you need to patent this thing to shoot. all right so, so your answer is joe maybe but paul but curtain patent laws is problematic oh. all right huh. l and p if you could add one single feature to your gun without any added cost or drawback, what would it have been? Hmm. What would you do right now? Poof, make it happen. Magic wand. I like that. I know my answer, but I'm not the guy that developed yeah, it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I know the you one want red dot. You got it. You want, you want yeah. to build red dot. Yeah. Hmm. <sighs> mm. It's a good one. It stumped you. Yeah, it's, it's a really yeah. good one. Now the question is, are you deliberating over too long a list or too short a list? So I'm trying to rethink all the things we did. Um, the intent was for everything about it to be deliberate. So because you know, there's that mine's a short list. There, really, yeah. you go for it. Well, uh, I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. It's not short. <laughs> the uh, you look at the cost savings if we'd have gone to some slightly uh, modular grip of uh, on the steel. Like something like an easy connecting portion, and there, there's multiple iterations. Like uh, STI is a great example of that uh, the Chris Sphinx, uh, the the cost savings they have was just brilliant. Um, something uh, like that would have would have saved a lot of time, a lot of broaching tools. Hmm. Um, it's interesting that your question isn't a feature to the gun, but a manufacturing technique. I find that that's an interesting thing that you're going down. Uh, so manufacturing is where our you know our yeah. ramp up and that, all that. That's where the uh, challenge. That's where the challenges lay. Yeah, <laughs> saying the gun is the easy part, making it the hard part. Well, no, we, we we spent so much energy, so much time, and so much money on the design and engineering, mm -hmm. um, and we went through three separate prototypes to get where we were at. So we spent a lot of time thinking over those decisions. <sighs> mm. Yeah, I, it, I, it would be I a manufacturing it. thing, I, I okay. think, at this point. From 
It's pretty fascinating. Where, yeah. where all the hair ripping out moments have come <laughs> I'll, from. I'll, 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 make, I'll make you laugh. And we, our program engineer, who I keep on referencing, has been with us. He got on right after shot. Right after shot. shot. But he just he helped us a ton and is awesome. Uh, but whenever he came on board, he was like, I don't think you had to lower that recoil spring that far and make it look so weird. <laughs> And that's actually an engineer you want on your team. Oh, you want that guy. It bothered me for yeah. three days. I burst into his office and said, you're wrong. I remember everything that happened. We did that deliberately and it was because of testing. So yeah. shut up. And he starts laughing. He thought it was the funniest thing yeah. that it bothered me so bad that it, I had to rethink everything that we did that led us to, to doing that. Yeah, you have to go. And why did... Oh, right, right, right. That. Yeah. Oh, yes, there was a reason. And why do I move my face here if I'm holding that? Oh, right, because it'll shoot across. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's the guy you want, though. You want people yeah, like that. Absolutely. Those. Oh, yeah. You want to encourage that type of behavior. Oh, right, oh, so. oh yeah. Yeah. He's just, he's just an ass. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, here we go. Uh, Anders A. Are you planning to release wood grips? Oh, I'd love to do that, guys. If we, if we had the time and energy, what I'd really like to do is if you know anyone who likes to make wood grips, have them contact us. We'll send them an NDA, and we'll send them the print spec. We aren't keeping that to ourselves. Anyone who you know that does the v, uh, that VZ, VZ makes ours, anyone at G10, Micarta, anyone who, wants you, who you want to do custom grips, have them contact us. We're, we want the aftermarket to support. Same awesome. thing with sites. Yes. We're going to hit it up eventually. Yeah, we'll I know that. <laughs> no, but the, that, you know That'd be cool. This gun is, it's on the higher end. It's a its a nice, beautiful looking pistol. And I think a nice piece of wood on there would actually, wood stocks would go a long way. And I, I have seen some gorgeous custom made burled wood oh, things for like 1911s. Yeah. That, oh, that, that look awesome. That's what's on my Wilson. Right? All right, all right. Yeah, that would look, that would be so. Oh, there, there's his answer from the last question. <laughs> But yeah, reach out. It sounds like we can get people together. I oh, bet yes. that's a real easy thing to come across if we just put a little effort into oh, that. That'd be fun. All right, Patrick W. You kind of touched on this, I think. You kind of teased it. Do you have plans or ambitions of someday doing something with rifles or carbines? I, Is that too way ahead into the radar? Right, right, right now with where the rifle market, there are so many great options. And there are so many companies that have invested uh, just a decade or 20 years in perfecting where they're at. Mm -hmm. It would have to be a, a it have to be a stroke of, huh? Why aren't we doing that? That's never been done before, sort of thing. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That that uh before we reach into that, and my my passion has always been pistols. Mm -hmm. So um, this was this was where it, as uh, as we have time to grow and try other designs, mm -hmm. maybe the passion will uh, keep on being able to grow into more products. But definitely, have always been pistols for me. To double down on your point, though, I don't think there's been as much development effort in pistols as there has been rifles. I mean, when you look at rifles, everything under the sun has been tried 18 different ways. And you don't see that as much with pistol development. I mean, we got to the browning system and a couple of different things, and we're like, meh, pretty good. Like, And we never really moved away from that. Not really. Cool. So, all right. I see something going on back there, but I'll, uh, I won't poke at it. All right. Alex P. Uh, this I, think, is, I think we're seeing some insight into the how did you balance doing everything with yeah. making one thing perfect. But I mean, you'd agree with that, right? The pistols really haven't seen the same focus. Well, and They're, for good reason, rifles are military application yeah. where the pistols are. But yeah. So if you don't have to change, it, but, I mean, it's, it's harder to get a pistol contract. The companies yeah. that pursue that for so many years. I mean, they, they went through yeah. they went through a pistol trial. What was it in the '60s where the Smith Wesson 39-2 was competing with? I mean, uh. uh well, the problem is, language. pistols uh, are just, what, what else the pistols were. Like, pistols yeah. are just not that important for military, and they're not willing to spend a lot of money to get a really, really good one. It's definitely a more civilian and law enforcement market than a military one. I mean, the military application of the pistol is quite limited. Officers and the occasional SF guy or whatever. I'm not saying it wouldn't be great to get the contract. No, 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 of course, money of course not, but that's why the development isn't pushed as yeah. hard as rifles are. Mm. In contracts, that, that's actually been something that's really um, been different. Um, a lot of people are like, well, what contract were you going for when you started this? You weren't. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, that wasn't the target. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was the American shooter consumer mm -hmm. market. Well, what, I saw it somewhere, I think it was in a history of Glock I was reading, mm -hmm. where someone pointed out that like the NYPD has more handguns than the Austrian army. Initial oh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Unless you're talking about a cup like the top three militaries in the world, the civilian markets 
as big or bigger. And yeah. if you look back at history, going after a specific contract does not necessarily mean you're going to be making a quality product. Yeah. Like, I mean, let's go back in history. No gas ports drilled allowed. I mean, yeah. these are some dumb requirements happen mm -hmm. in contracts. Yeah. Commission designed firearms are frequently a bad thing. And those contracts are that, right? We yeah. want these specific requirements. Not all of them are thought through, and you come you come out with this kind of weird thing as a result. It doesn't necessarily translate to any other market segment that yeah. you make a product for. I try to stay real positive. For, <laughs> forget, <laughs> forget the mainline contract. Build the gun for the civilian market, and then get all the special forces guys together. Well, if you build something fantastic and awesome, they're going to want it enough that the contract in the future will reflect what you designed, is yeah. what I would probably argue. Yeah. Right. That's right. Is, it was pretty fun. I have a, a few few buddies who are in group right now, um, to, because that's where they decided to put their time and energy in. I was able to get them a pistol, and oh, that awesome. was pretty fun. Very cool. Uh, that was pretty fun. Awesome. Uh, that's a good day. <laughs> we touched on this earlier, and we said it about ten. But let's go ahead and hit it. Alex P, are you going to make this in three fifty seven Sig? I like the Hudson, but there are a lot of nine millimeter handguns for less money. All right. Um, I think a high-end handgun should be offered in a more interesting caliber. I'm going to go ahead and say this. I think 57 SIG is even less compelling than 10 millimeter. <laughs> uh, so then the business uh, hat goes on. No offense to Alex, Third, but I mean, yeah. there's probably less people buying that than there is even 10. So the and I actually I, I, I find this to be almost an awesome. Well, first off, it's a fan base which I love. I love when people get behind, you know behind something and really uh, get excited about it. But starting our company, if we'd gone with 357 SIG or 10 or, or 38 Super or something that... Or the ever-compelling 45 Gap. Something where it's not the market <laughs> norm, we would have had a much greater challenge uh, yeah. introducing okay. our product. We see this a lot with comments. People want to talk, why 9, why 556? Five, five, because that's the thing. It's like so dominating in the market. There's almost... Yeah. There's almost no compelling argument to not do 5.56 five, and 9mm on whatever you're working Why on. Why don't you build a new car that runs on kerosene? Well, you could. So, but, yeah. Yeah. Well, we, yeah. we, we were talking about this earlier. I mean, it's it's part of the evolution of firearms, 9 millimeters. Of, I don't know. You probably know this. When, when did it first get introduced? Over 100 years ago. Over 100 years ago. And then there was a time where everyone said the ballistics aren't right. And so they uh, but that was 9. It went from 45 to 9 because the ballistics weren't right. And then they went to 40. And then we went to 357 SIG, and I'm sure I'm missing just huge oh, gaps in history. Because every cartridge was um, so, yeah. But during that time, development on 9mm did not stop. No, it did not. And it's, because it's become such a standard, that cartridge has really become something far more than it ever was ever anticipated to be when it was originally yeah. developed. Same Absolutely. with 556. Five, Absolutely. Yeah. 1908, the PO8 Luger, first 9mm handgun? Uh, somewhere in 1908. Well, I'm sure it was developed six, before that, four, but I think. But 08 is when the first 08 was when the first nine millimeter military issue handgun. Because before that, no. it was 30 Luger. No, the Na the German Navy Lugers were 1904, and those were in nine. Were they in nine? Yeah. No. Oh. Cool. All right. So yes, we were both close. I was close. But yeah. Okay. Interesting. That's but why, I mean, that's why I said over a hundred years. Yeah, well, 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 08 is over a hundred years too. Exactly. Right, fair. Um, <laughs> clever. See how Ian plays the way, the game. Um, but um, no. But I mean, like we're saying, nine millimeter and five five six. There's been so much work put into these cartridges that yeah. I don't. Now, the argument against them is extremely hard to make. The follow up question I'm sure people are going to ask is, well, three fifty seven six is the same case, so all you have to do is make a new barrel mm. that's thirty no. five mm. cat, right? No, no. no. We okay. would have to look. We would be shooting the absolute snot out of the slide, the barrel, and then putting it under uh, stress analysis just over and over and iterating over and over because every time they try to take any shortcut on changing caliber to something with different powder or just a different ballistic configuration, you are taking the wrong shortcut. Mm -hmm. You build a pistol around a caliber. Now there are there are exceptions to this, like we said, the SKP4, mm -hmm. and they did it from the ground up. right? from the ground up and it was a sleek little neat one but it was for the smaller calipers but and that's that was a design philosophy we took you don't have to agree with it but that is one of the ones we took some automatic and fully automatic firearms are like helicopters you change one thing in that paradigm and everything shifts so the parts that you've tested under the pressure curve generated by the range of nine millimeter the minute you put 357 sig in there that all shifts your helicopter is now different and it may or may not stabilize yep <laughs> yeah it, well, it, timing everything so and you but the, all the testing we did on different nine mm -hmm. okay. yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, oh, they know. extended ammo tests on that, just seeing how everything behaves going through there. That's, yeah, and that's, that's a huge variety, variety of things. Absolutely. I mean, you've got lightweight 90 grain bullets, you've got 158 grain bullets, they got that whole spectrum. Yeah, you mm -hmm. got major, major power plus P factor for. Yeah. You got oh. Sammy, not Sammy, hot rod, all that stuff going on with just one cartridge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Firearms fuel and fabrication. Any plans for a threaded barrel version and has your system been tested with suppressors? Yeah, that's all you. That was quiet. <laughs> yes, definite plans for threaded barrel. We cool. um, we are currently testing and Okay. Yeah. Yes. Does the barrel the locking lug configuration introduce any really fundamentally different challenges for a suppressor? That's actually where, uh, with the testing that we're doing right now, you take a look at slide velocity to make yeah. sure you're not Slide velocity and spring weight. Yeah. If we need to sell a threaded barrel with the spring mm -hmm. as a complete ah, kit, okay. I would rather do that than someone be, I shot the crap out of this and ruined the threads and it mm -hmm. slide going too fast. You, you just drop in a suppressor or a threaded barrel with a suppressor and it might work until it doesn't kind mm -hmm. of scenario? Yep. Yep. Right, okay. Um, but that's on, that's on any... I've, I've ruined a couple pistols just putting a suppressor and dirty barrel on it, not not doing anything. You know what? This goes <laughs> this goes right back to the helicopter comment. Suppressing yeah. Yeah. a gun completely changes the the the, the harmonics of the firearm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Interesting. Okay. ARs are so obviously one of those quintessential arguments when you talk about that twenty inch gas system, fourteen. You get to ten and a half, things get weird, right? Mm -hmm. You have this parameter, and if you're outside of it, it goes wrong. Oh, I, I remember my first suppressor that I, we put on an AR. I was like, this is so cool. And then I'm like, gat, gat. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is, I'm, such a, I'm so awesome. Like, that's, that's terrible. <laughs> okay. But we just got a few more, guys. Thank you for hanging in here. <laughs> Thank you for hanging in for such a long Q&A. Uh, um, so Billy K. Jr., what advice would you have for someone who wants to get into firearms manufacturing but has limited funds for machines and materials? Do you have a, a gorilla approach to this? That you know, I'm interested to hear this answer because I get people asking me that. Question. Yeah. Well, you guys kind of did it. You started with power with PowerPoint and paint. It <laughs> yeah. sounds like that. Yeah, and we, it, it helped that we stayed under the radar and that we had multiple engineering uh, approaches that were outside of the industry, uh, we, so that we didn't lose. Our we design. also used our entire deployment savings. So, yep. That's something we haven't talked about much. We talked about it when we first met you guys, but I mean, you really put your your future on the line with this, I believe. Yeah. So, but what's the? I mean, power. Are you recommending PowerPoint and paint? I mean, uh, I mean I, no. Okay. Uh, so if you don't have um, a nest egg or or something where you're, uh, you can put it toward that. Uh, develop your sense of being a judge of human character. Mm -hmm. And then your sense of legal protection, yeah. um, because you're going to need someone to help you through this. Unle and unless invest you, in legal protection before you invest in tooling, machining. Yeah. Unless you are Tony Stark. If you're Tony Stark, always be Tony Stark and do it all on your own and go for it. If if your drawings solely exist on paper in your garage and you're going to do your first thing that way, obviously have your FFL and oh yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm not trying to give any kind of. But um, the the legal protection side of the house, because when you become more and more onto something, it... do you think there is a realistic opportunity for someone today to come up with, let's say, a legitimately good idea and take it to a firearms company? That's that's the way a lot of this industry worked in centuries past. Was inventor comes up with the idea, and then they partner with an industrialist who produces the thing. Is that a viable Ideas option? Ideas are sold, today? but I don't know that too many of them, like you said, you guys haven't seen a lot of change in the handgun market mm -hmm. for a, a very long mm -hmm. period of time that, you know, uh, where it gets shelved, I, I don't yeah. doubt that patents haven't been bought, though. I just don't know that they've necessarily had to be used because Start with your history, sales are good. <laughs> create, create your case studies, and at this point with this question, at some point, there needs to be some people in this industry starting our own Shark Tank or whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it. Oh, that, interesting. That, that would that would be that'd be a lot of fun. I need to be a judge on that. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Whoever <laughs> watches this, you know, this is the start. This, that'd be fun. You know, actually, what you what you're saying, and I think maybe you're glossing over it um, a little bit, is the fir first you have to have an idea, and then the second thing you have to do is be able to convince anybody else that your idea is actually good. 
-hmm. Obviously, you're going to think it's awesome, mm -hmm. but prove it to someone else. Because if you can't convince someone else, let somebody tell you your baby's ugly. Because multiple, right. multiple, multiple, multiple times, <laughs> as long as you own it first. And I know we said that it takes some money for legal protection on this, but mm -hmm. this is where your case studies and research start with the patents. Know what know what went before, and then um, once you research that and you have something good enough, pay the money to get it legally protected, and then yeah, iterate you convince someone and else. Iterate. Yeah. I, you know, I was going to augment what you said, but I think we're touching on this slightly because you keep talking about the legal side of this, and that's an incredibly important part of any uh, business endeavor. Yeah. But if you really have a very clever idea, um, I'm a very skeptical person of any power structure, and I'm very uh, cautious about governments, religions, and corporations. Mm -hmm. So you take this really cool idea, and you go to Bob at X, and you believe, all right, Bob, I'm going to show you this because I want to work with you. The next thing you know, that company X is making your product. Yeah. Right. And and, and how, how do you prevent that, especially if you're a low-funding kind of guy? That's a scary prospect. Well, that's what he's saying about judge of human character and legal protection. Boy, I don't think you can judge the human character that, of a corporation. That's very, very, very difficult. Yeah. Um, Even if Bob's okay, the corporation may not be. Um, yeah. Remember, a lot of the gun companies out there are not these huge megalithic corporations. A lot of these things are smaller companies than people might expect. Doesn't mean they won't go boop and true. be making that in a year, though. It's yeah. true. Yeah. A lot of a lot of case studies, just like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of cool ideas have gone the way of the buffalo. That this is this is a recurring theme against all technologies. A lot of people that made good ideas and someone else actually profited from them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. common problem. Matisse E. This is kind of like the New York one. What would it take for Hudson Manufacturing to be willing to go through the process to be able to sell their pistol in California? Didn't we already talk about shipping outside the United States? We did talk about <laughs> shipping outside the United States. That's, um, that's bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but I mean, I know that I, if I remember from our last conversation a year ago about that, you, you weren't targeting them because it's such a challenging process. Micro stamping alone, since we're not already on the, the list, we're not grandfathered in, that's a, uh, I mean... Wow. That's a, I didn't even think about that. Forgot you about would micro have stamping. to actually implement micro serial number micro stamping, wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, for which you just can't California. because it's a fundamentally flawed concept that simply doesn't. It's work. a failed technology, it is. and it, it that has been what state has recognized that it was a Maryland. I think Maryland had had it at one point, got rid of it. Okay, I, I, think, I think. Yeah. So I mean, I, this I, in the comments. I, I, yeah, well, and this isn't meant to be hatred for anyone. They were sorry that you're stuck in that situation, but I believe it's become so cost prohibitive. Yes. But unless you're a very large organization already, it's kind of not going to happen. We could we could create. I know I know you hate them, but a, ma a magazine disconnect safety um, and all the other requirements. We could actually implement those from a design and engineering standpoint. That's completely doable. It's the micro stamping that's keeping us from California. Is mm -hmm. it's a failed technology? Doesn't matter what we did mm -hmm. it, it doesn't we, we would most likely be denied so is this to be said that any new handgun on the market is not going to make it into california have they have i don't know if they have i haven't really paid attention to that question. but i mean there's another thing too where you got to supply like x number of pistols and they got to run them over with tanks or whatever right and cover them in mayonnaise I mean, the, or whatever the it is tooling they do and the technology yeah. alone that would go into that and that that ten round magazine is going to come out first yeah right that makes sense you need you need that yeah. so that, and that fixes the new york problem mm -hmm. But the stuff they do there to get the gun approved is extreme. Yeah. So, well, uh, that and, and as far as that, keep keep fighting the good fight. Uh, yeah. Keep going and voting. Uh, I'll and, be honest with you. My answer to these people is move. Um, <laughs> this sounds like a horrible answer, but things have become so untenable in that environment, not just for firearms, that you have to really question, unless you have no choice, mm -hmm. what am I doing here, right? I mean, and, and if you're interested in things like a Hudson H9, you're living in a place that is it's worse than Europe in many ways, in some ways. It's this is a really almost impossible not to crack. Maybe we should get the other forty six state to you know, <laughs> a, a couple of G you know, everyone wants to see that change. Uh, enough people raise their hand and say they'll move to California. I, I, I feel bad for that, but it's like when Stop stop giving up territory. I, guess. I, don't know. <laughs> I feel bad for it, but the reality is bringing that there would be such a problem. Uh, when you see micro stamping and all that, it's kind of in fact now the new ammo restrictions. Even if you get the gun, you can't shoot the damn thing. Can't buy enough ammo, right? I mean, the, there's so many issues. Yeah, but, but yes, you are a very extensive market, and we would very much like to. That's the question that. I did want to ask. So this comes up enough, and we've seen other manufacturers go through the flaming loopholes. I mean, mm -hmm. they'll jump through every loop possible to get their pistol or their rifle on the California market. Mm -hmm. It's that big an economy? It, 
It's huge. It's massive. It I mean, I, I'm kind of asking this as yeah. a rhetorical yeah. question, but it's that big an economy? Yes. yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that would be... Wish we could support now. What is that? One-tenth of the gun team. buying population, at least by numbers of mm -hmm. people who keep on asking, would probably be in California. That's simply just wow. our customer service. That's crazy. So, so, so that you guys don't get heat from my comments, the reality is you'd love to support the California I market. The California to. laws are so difficult that you can't currently afford to navigate them. It Correct. is prohibitive. Yeah. yeah. It, so that's so it's not you, it's them causing not the it's the, it's the California <laughs> government. Blame someone else. This is the California government preventing you from having an H9. There you go. And there's one more question here for some weirdo. Carl K. Mm -hmm. What do I need to do to get a different rear sight? <laughs> so here's Finally, the deal. The last one. Yeah, not everyone's not everyone's had the chance to shoot your fine pistol. And, uh, and so far, we've had we've had a couple matches under our belt. Mm -hmm. Ian, you and I can talk about this. It handles awesome. I, love it. I want a red dot. But the other thing I have is for me. And for others, this particular pistol, if not others, is shooting low. Mm -hmm. And what I need is a higher rear sight. So the, the cuts are MMP front sight cuts. We tried other cuts on it. We tried everything from a CZ-75. Um, we didn't go Glock. We went with, uh, we tried the... Um, Let me stop you for a second. The front no, sight yes. you have chosen, which is a red dot with a tritium insert, is yeah. wonderful. The front sight's fantastic. I love it. But the rear sight's just... It's not high enough. Sights, <laughs> sights are like holsters, and we yeah. had we had to, and we saw personal, and we mm -hmm. knew that no matter what we did, um, different people were going to want different things. I know uh, Matt Helm and, and Knife Maker Texas has already put on a fiber optic on his, mm -hmm. and it made me laugh the first time I saw the picture because it's so personal. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted something that showed that we were not just going to put three dots on it and just go for that. We wanted to make it premium and we wanted something that we saw a, a, a portion of the market going towards, which was the blacked out rears and the orange uh, with the tritium insert, which keeps it at a, at a premium level. Yep. And that, that was where we wanted to start. The delay meant that we could not devote our time to get into uh, the aftermarket to support different side options. So you can change out your front side right now, mm -hmm. Currently, there are no other rear sights that are being made. That is, if you that know... That matches the profile of the rear of the gun. So, so let me add to that. So let me say this. The sight picture is fantastic. I yeah. love the sight picture. I, I just need the rear to be higher. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm asking. So what? What? I know that sounds like simple. All I want is more stuff. <laughs> but but it's, gonna, it's inevitable that people are going to, not just the... The preference, mm -hmm. yep. but there are different firing styles, whatever. Yep. Uh, some people are going to need that rear sight to have different heights. Mm -hmm. uh, I and like, I don't want to change the front because the front's great. I'd like every sight maker to be able to offer a set. Are you going to be able to offer different variable heights, for example? It's not something that we would 100% shy away from, but similar to the, the grip panel question, um, we, we aren't sight makers. We, we worked on building the, the pistol as a whole. That's so the sights are made from someone else currently. Well, the front is for sure. The rear is as well. That's well, a contracted that, out part? That is ours that we contracted out. Okay. It is. So, yep. so okay. our design so that we could match the rear profile. But um, so the, the decision that we ultimately made from having the cuts done is that the front sight cut mm -hmm. is an MMP. Right. The rear sight cut is also an MMP front sight cut. Oh, so ultimately, at the end of the day, we decided, okay, let's make the, if, if we're not going to make a decision on an existing rear sight that we're going to put on our gun, doesn't match the profile the way we wanted it to. And you can mill this at the same time with the same, same, same cutters. Same cutters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. So I could have two front sights. That'd be kind of awesome. <laughs> you go for it. You, you, yeah, you, but let me, you let me, go for it. What I wanted to say is I, I really appreciate the thought put into this, and I really do like the sight picture. This this being in a 90-degree angle for being able to cock it on something difficult or on your belt, I don't know if that was thought through, but that's a good feature. I won't say that we'll put that in any literature. And, you know, just in case I can say that. Them. This is thought through so that when you're doing one-handed manipulations, it's very good for that. This yeah. is fantastic. The actual rear sight and the way it's striated to deflect light and to give you a nice black rear sight is excellent as well. The actual cut in the U gives you a good sight picture. It just shoots low. It just shoots low. It just shoots low. <laughs> Same thing for you. Yeah. Okay. That's all I'm saying is higher. That's it. That's all. Uh, is it low at every range, or is it at where you're engaging? In, I ex I, in my experience, it was low everywhere I shot yeah. it from. Yeah. In my experience, it was really close to being on 147 grain ammo. It likes it, it likes heavier yeah. bullets. It does like it likes 124s and 147s way mm. more than it likes 150s. I'm going to make you cringe. I tried 158s. I don't know if that's okay. Um, how did it go? It, Better, but still low. Um, it's not like I said. What I landed up doing is lollipopping. I, I superimposed the front sight above the rear, and that worked for me just fine. 
but I, I don't want to need to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm no, just, you, yeah, yeah. You, no. You, right. If you're if you're having an issue, by the way, it is limited lifetime warranty. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it back. I'll put it in the vice, and that's how we're testing anyone who has any issue. It gets. Do you have ransom out. insert built for? The, do you have? We can we get ransom? Oh, we can get them then. Because mm -hmm. oh, I, I have access to a ransom rest. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's all. Okay. I have I have access yeah. to a ransom rest. I but, just don't uh, have access to the inserts. And I, I will say that because Elijah, our uh, our resident, he, he's put more rounds on the H9 than even us at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. But uh, he uh, he loves shooting 124 Black Hills. Okay. Uh, and he, he, he that's that's his pref preferential. I appreciate your offer, but I am not willing to let it out <laughs> of my grimy hands long enough to send it back to you. I'm yeah. I'm okay with my lollipop side picture for now. I'll say that. Yeah. But I just that's it's 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 an inevitable reality. That's not going to need to happen. It need, so. Well, actually, like I said. I want every site maker to make a site set that for anyone can do whatever they want to on the pistol. And yeah, there's no charge for that. We'll have an NDA, send you over the specs. Same deal. Same deal. You heard it here. Awesome. Get on the ball, guys. Yeah, yeah, totally. Cool. Anything you want to add, Ian? Boy, I think we did a pretty in-depth coverage. This was a long Those were some good questions. Thank you very much to all the Patreon folks out there for submitting this cool list of questions. Yeah, and I got to thank you two for coming out here to us to do this with us. Because, I mean, that was I'm pretty honored and humbled that you guys are willing to come out to Arizona and uh, film yeah, with us. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks Absolutely. for hosting. Wish you could have got out here sooner. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have some other footage, too. We're going to have some stuff yes. on the other channel. We're going to yep. also have some more on InRange. We're going to have a teardown of the gun with you guys, which I think is awesome. We're going to do some shooting tomorrow, too, which should be fun. Get to shoot yeah. your own gun for once. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I want to point this out. Yeah. Um, these guys don't actually have their own Hudson 9s yet because they're Ouch. shipping everything that has that's being produced. That uh, is true. Our, the one that we have here with us right now still says Proto, I think it's 064 on yes. the side. Proto 064. Our, our, our insert chassis are made, but uh, everything else that we're getting is going toward the distributors. You're literally the cobbler that does not have shoes. Yes. Yeah. Right, <laughs> that's right. how that works. It, yeah. Making was, a dent in those purchase orders. Well, hopefully so. soon. Well, thank you for being so kind as to getting one to us as a, as yeah. a result instead, since you don't have one for yourself. That's a shame. We appreciate yeah. it enough. We'll even let you shoot ours. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. But thanks again, and uh, thanks again to the Patreon supporters for supporting the, supplying the questions, but also for supporting the channel, Yes, especially with all the stuff going on. So, guys, you are the core and the lifeblood of InRange because we are demonetized. You are the reason InRange exists. So if you are there, one of those Patreon supporters, please keep on fighting the good fight. We thank you for that. If you're not one, please consider getting on board. Uh, if not, the only the other thing you can do for us, which is just as valuable, subscribe to the channels and share the content with your friends because you're the guys that promote our content for us when the AI bot won't. So thanks for watching. <laughs>